Look how much I love my son. He doesn't even have a penis anymore. Those women online displaying themselves, they're not human. You're a fool if you think that's human. And Jews, you know, they have IQs that are probably 15 points higher than the typical. So they're Whoa. radically overrepresented. Over there, there's no reason to assume at all that the religious enterprise can't degenerate into totalitarian psychopathy, for that matter. It does all the time. Is that controversial? <laughs> yes. All right, there is a doomsday clock that we use to track how close we are to nuclear annihilation. The closer to midnight, mm -hmm. theoretically, the higher the risk. If we had a doomsday clock for how close we are to a totalitarian takeover of the West, how close to midnight would it be? It depends on what we decide to do. It, the opportunities there at, for a, a pervasive totalitarian state, the likes of which we can hardly imagine, instituted with a rapidity we can hardly conceive of. That's there. It's right there in front of us. So that's the eye of Sauron, by the way. Why? Well, if you dispense with God, you create a Tower of Babel, and that was what was represented in the Lord of the Rings as the Tower of Sauron, technological tower. And what was on the top of it? A big eye. That could see everything. Mm. Exactly. So... If you don't have, this is one way of thinking about it, if you forgo your relationship with the omniscient, that's a good way of thinking about it, you'll create a technology that replicates that for you, except there'll be nothing about it that will be your friend, and it will watch everything you do. No matter how hard you try to make yourself invisible, let's say, with the ring of power. Okay, so I want to understand what what is the proclivity in the human soul that leads us back to this? And let me give you a right. little bit of context and then uh, go into it. So mm -hmm. you introduced me to Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Yeah. I actually read the Gulag Archipelago. That sent me on a terrifying journey of reading about every totalitarian state that I could get oh, my yeah. hands on. Oh, yeah. Uh, ended up really scaring me about how humans can break bad in a way yeah. that I felt I was looking around and seeing people trying to gobble up power, uh, top-down authority, a sense of, I know what's right, and therefore you should do what I say. And that even mm -hmm. when it comes in the package of, oh, I'm going to save you, like Mao's mm -hmm. China. It's usually when the package it comes in. Yeah. And, and yet kills 100 plus million people. So is it only darkness in the human soul? Is it only pride or is there it's the something else? spirit of else? pride. It's the eternal spirit of pride, allied with deceit and resentment and arrogant, arrogance. That's the spirit that Milton characterized in Paradise Lost. Is it, is it only human? No, clearly not. It it's exists. not only human, what do you mean? Well, it'll be there long after you are. It's immortal in a way. That's a way of thinking about it. But it feels like it would propagate only through the human mind. What do you mean only? That there is no other option. I mean, we could get into AI, but I want to segment this yeah. out. The, the reason I want to tease this apart is I believe that people are possessed by ideas that mm -hmm. if they, they- allow themselves to become possessed by ideas. They invite them in, yeah. Even better. People yeah. invite in ideas. Those yeah. ideas are going to govern the quality of their life. And then as mm -hmm. enough of us aggregate around good or bad ideas, the mm -hmm. quality of our lives get better mm -hmm. or worse. That's the it war is of principalities. So that's, what, that's right. That's right. What I want people to understand is uh, Solzhenitsyn's idea of the line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man. Mm -hmm. uh, we all have this temptation towards totalitarianism, born mm -hmm. of pride. Mm -hmm. uh, Especially smart people. So how do we avoid it? Fear. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Well, what you, is God you, then? The antithesis of the of the spirit of totalitarian pride. Can I simplify that? So, well, one, imagine this. Okay, sure, sure. Imagine this. Imagine that. Here's a form of hell. Um, Auschwitz guard, enjoying his job. Mm. Okay, now, I think it's it's fair to say that your experience. Exposing yourself to such things has convinced you that there's such a thing as evil. Okay. Whatever is farthest in the opposite direction, that's God. What is that? Well, that's not a simple thing to say. I mean, God is ineffable. God is the ineffable spirit that unites all. That's a good way of thinking about it. 
So what does that mean? Well, it means an endless number of things, right? Many of which can't be formulated in words, much of which is directly experienced, and embodied, um, imagined, felt, motivated, all of that, not just words. It's certainly not something that can be encapsulated in a, in a set of declarative statements, which is partly what the West is confused about. We think that belief in God is adherence to a statable description of God or a creed. That's not what it is. That's, that's a very small fragment of what it is. Just as our verbal knowledge is a small fragment of our totality. Can I give you what I think you're saying in my language yeah, and tell sure. me if I'm getting correct? Okay, uh, everyone's going to be familiar with the idea of the madness of crowds. And there is mm -hmm. something terrifying. If you've ever been around a group that goes from a normal group and they snap over mm -hmm. into fighting or whatever, you mm -hmm. feel... Short-term mob. Yeah, you feel a spirit mm -hmm. overcome them sure. where they are linked and it changes something in the way that they are processing the inputs from their environment. Definitely. It changes their perceptual frame. Yes. Perfect. It changes their emotions. It changes what they see. It changes what they're aiming at, even unconsciously. It's no different than, the, in some ways, it's no different than the spirit that unites a crowd when it leaps to, the, to its feet spontaneously after a particularly brilliant goal. Right? That's also a form of possession, although much more positive form of possession, because that's a celebration of the ability to hit the mark, which is the opposite of sin. Right? Sin means to miss the mark. There's three separate derivations of the word sin that come from archery. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's what people are doing in a stadium is they're allowing themselves to be possessed by the spirit that hits the target brilliantly. Right? All What's together, collectively. That, it's a form of worship. What's interesting in that, uh, so let's put two pins in things. So one, the hell is the exact opposite. It's when the crowd goes mad, it breaks bad, it kills, it smashes, it breaks. And then God is the exact opposite of that. It's expansive, joyful, uplifting, and unifying, thriving. And unifying, right? Both so, can so be it unifying, has that, though. It has that, yes, it's the proper unity. That's another way. These are definitions, right? They're not statements. They're not statements. They're not descriptive statements about God. They're definitions. They're definitions. That's a very, very different thing. So imagine that there is a spirit that properly unifies. That's, that's the monotheistic God. That's the God of Abraham. What is that? Well, you know, who can say? No one can say. We can tell stories about it. And of course, the biblical stories are stories about that. That's exactly what they are. But the fastest way in for modern people, I would say, is the route you took. If you don't believe in good, well... Try investigating evil and see what you make of that. And then start to understand what that means for you and see what that does to you. It's one of the things I realized, because I started studying malevolence a very long time ago. Now it's, it's 50 years for me. It's a long time. And I certainly became convinced that in some ways there was nothing more real than malevolence. Now, there are arguable contenders. Pain, for example, is a contender. But if malevolence is an undeniable reality, and there's a price to be paid for denying that, by the way, because you turn the Nazi catastrophe into just a matter of opinion, right? If you don't believe in something like the ultimate reality of evil, it's just, well, you know, the Nazis went about things a slightly different way. Who's to say what's right or wrong? And while the opposite of that, there's an opposite of that. Right? It's, what it, it's wherever you go if you travel as far away from enjoying Auschwitz as you can possibly go. And people might say, well, no one enjoyed Auschwitz. It's like, really? What was the sign over Auschwitz? The joke. Work will make you free. People joked. You tell me they didn't, didn't enjoy it. Slayer. If you think that people didn't enjoy Auschwitz, you know nothing about human beings and nothing about yourself. Mm. If you think you couldn't have enjoyed it, you know nothing about yourself. And that's terrifying and should be. And that it can lead you. You see, that leads you because it gives you something solid to stand on. Something terrible, terrible and solid, but nonetheless, something motivating. Because maybe you decide that you don't want to go to hell, so to speak. And maybe you don't want to bring everyone you love along with you. Maybe you don't even want to bring everyone you hate along with you. That's a good realization. Better to redeem than to 
damn. You changed my life with a simple idea. And that simple idea was that um, I could find myself as the guard in Auschwitz and not as the person hiding mm -hmm. um, Anne Frank in my attic. Oh, yeah, oh, five of them. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that scared me saw because- that Yes. I mean, God, the thing, it just terrified me in Toronto. It was something remarkable to behold. All these butter won't melt in your mouth, hyper moral Canadians, you know, secure in the fact that they're nothing, for example, like the warmongering Americans to the South, delighting in the fact that they could turn their neighbors over to the state with a phone call, willing to wear those goddamned masks for the rest of their life just to have the privilege of being a state informant. Brutal, brutal. Awful. So I look at that and I see myself and I say, okay, the line between which way I go on that runs through my heart. This is where I get obsessed with the idea of, okay, I'm going to be possessed by ideas. Which ideas do I want to invite in? That's why Christ says that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It takes root and grows inside you. Like all ideas. Ideas are alive. Richard Dawkins figured this out, although he didn't take it to its logical conclusion. A living idea is a meme. All ideas are alive. And what do I mean by that? Well, they're instantiated in your nervous system. Like, how are they not alive? How do they not have a perspective? How do they not have an aim, a set of motivations, um, the desire to communicate? Even Nietzsche, Nietzsche said, every drive attempts to philosophize in its own spirit. Nietzsche knew these things. And then you do, you, you, you incorporate, you take in, you eat. Sometimes things you shouldn't. That's the eternal sin of mankind. To incorporate even the forbidden fruit. What's the forbidden fruit? Knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean? You don't get to make the moral rules. And that's where Nietzsche went wrong. We don't, we can't create our own values. We have to abide by the intrinsic order of the cosmos. And Richard Dawkins knew this too. He wrote a paper stating that biological organisms had to be a microcosm of the environment in which they evolved. It's like, okay, Dr. Dawkins, how far are you willing to take that? A human being's a personality. Does that mean that the cosmos is a personality? Is it something you have a relationship with? That's how we're adapted. So he can take that wherever, however he wants. The, the avatar of the spirit of enlightenment rationality, right? That, that's, that's a snake that's now devoured its own tail. So that's why the enlightenment is coming to an end. Yes, we are for sure going to talk about that. Before we get to that, though, I, I How really... How did you notice that I said that? Uh, you gave a speech. I, I, I listened to a lot of your stuff because you helped me think through complicated ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big believer in that um, by speaking, you're speaking so that you can understand, not mm -hmm. necessarily so you can be understood. So I seek mm -hmm. people that I see have the bravery to actually think out loud and process through. Also, for anybody watching, they will probably have heard me talk about this before, and I was telling you this before we started rolling. I was very confused when you went from the internet's dad, you got very sick, and you came back as like the internet's theologian, mm -hmm. and I could not figure out what that change was. Mm -hmm. uh, but as somebody who I had seen be a very careful thinker, I thought, okay, what if there was something here that I'm just not understanding yet? Let me try to map it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that you and I see this the same way. I don't know is the honest answer, and I hope we figure that out today. But I know that you have clarity of thought and there's internal consistency. And so that means that there's probably something very useful because you know what you're aiming towards. And this is the anchor we have to address before we can move on. We're away on. from. Yes, <laughs> yes, which to your point about... Uh, sin is missing the mark, but mm -hmm. that implies that there is, because I would say sin is hitting the wrong mark mm -hmm. if that's I had another to way of looking push at it. it. Well, that's, that's a deeper form of sin. Because that's right. what I think is happening right now. I really yeah. think you're the canary in the coal mine. What's happening to you with them trying to strip your license, even though I do hate the way you tweet, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but I listened to that whole episode where your friends were like, Jordan, please stop. I was literally in my house like, Jordan, please. Anyway, you get you should have the have right to, have to be a fully come out correct. You should be a fully fledged human being. You should not have to answer to us, even though as people who um, have gotten so much value out of the way that you think through problems, that's what we're responding to. Anyway, mm -hmm. so the thing we have to get to is I think sin is hitting the wrong mark, 
I think people are hitting that mark in spades. Mm -hmm. I think you've become the That's lightning why we rod of that. Worship pride. That's why we worship pride. Well, pride I have a has always take been. On pride that. has always been regarded as the ultimate sin. Before we, before we go down that path, let me, let me string this whole idea together. Uh, you're the canary in the coal mine because... Why would that be, I wonder? Uh, because you won't shut up about <laughs> things that people who believe... Because I take the stance that totalitarians actually are trying to do good. Some of them aren't, but I think that, that makes it too easy to push them away. Assume that they are just possessed by the wrong idea. And so they believe, I know what's best. I, I legitimately know what's best for humanity. Yeah, but that's the problem. I get it. Bear I with me. Know. And you are... Who's the I that knows, just out of curiosity? Uh, in that statement? Mm -hmm. That's I'm the saying, question. I, I'm saying I know how wrong that can go. Mm -hmm. Those people are saying they, they think they have identified the social structure that will lead to a utopia. They identify their I with the spirit of totalitarianism that has possessed them. They haven't gotten that far. They don't. They know may that. not even be smart enough to get that far, which is a whole other thesis I have about the complexity of ideas, which I think is a big part of what causes this problem, mm -hmm. is people cannot think through these incredibly complicated ideas. So they need bumper stickers. You give them a bumper sticker. They need parables. Ooh, you're trying to make it positive again. People will take a bumper sticker long before they will take a well, parable. A bumper parables stickers are yes, way that's more true. complicated. Yes, yes. That's, you, know what a, you know what slogan means. Yes. Uh, no, I don't know what it means. It's from it's from the Welsh, Slua Germ. It means battle cry of the dead. Why of the dead? Because slogans are dead words, and they're like as in they're dead rock wood. By, they're brandished by the army of the dead that would rather drag the living into the pit than prevail, than allow the living to prevail. It's battle cry of the dead. It's the army of the dead speaking through the mouths of people that use slogans. Okay, can I, I'm going to translate that. Yeah. Uh, you said earlier that... Well, you know how Solzhenitsyn talked about people who were possessed by an ideology, right? And they, their words, their words had no personal relationship to them. They were, they were merely mimicking an ideology. All the communists said exactly the same thing. There's nothing alive about that if everyone is saying exactly the same thing. Well, because, and this is, I suppose, where the left has something... Has, has something accurate perverted. There's a diversity and a vitality and originality in, in living speech that's not there in the, in the land of cliche and slogan. That's why you can't listen to people. Like when I listen to ideologues talk, it's just buzzing. I can't even hear it. My mind goes elsewhere instantly. There's nothing about it that's compelling. There's nothing that's gripping. Because or they're not testing the idea against feedback. There's multiple reasons for, because they're, because the speech is an indication that while they're speaking, they're not treading the golden path. What's the golden path? It's the path that grips attention and is inspiring. Okay. I have to say, you can give me space. I need to say this. That's, that's fine. All right. So, uh, I'm not trying to speak elusively. There's, no, no, no. There's... I know. I know. You and I just use such different language. And I think it will be very useful for people to hear the same thing said in like a Rosetta Stone yes, way. Yes, definitely. Okay. So I've heard you talk about this a lot. When you go out and do your talks, part of what makes them so captivating mm -hmm. is you are actually taking a living idea that you were trying to explore golden mm -hmm. path. Yeah. It's not rigid dogma. It is an idea you want to find the truth of. And so you mm -hmm. go out in front of a crowd to assess whether they're taking it in, what kind of it's like quest. silence, perfect. Mm -hmm. And so that idea is living in as much as it is not rigid, it is not fossilized. Mm -hmm. You want it's it to be tested. It's not predetermined, it's not dogmatic. Right, that's right. It's, that's why it's not dead. This... It's not already formulated. It's not a corpse. It's something alive that's happening right then and there, right? Right, and that's something that only spontaneous speech can manage. Even even books suffer from the lack of that. Now, books have their utility. They, in a book, when you write a book, when you read a book, you can deeply investigate an idea, but it does risk a kind of death, the death of the words on the page, because they're not as finely attuned to the demands of the situation, the specific situation, as a spontaneous speech can be when it's at its highest. Because it's of the moment. That notion that, you know, um, there's a, that's the third person of the Trinity, right? That spirit that possesses you when you speak in an inspired manner. 
That's a, and that's a symbolic representation of the living spirit of, of exploration in relationship to the highest goal. That's really what it is. And so, you know, you might say, well, what, what do you have to be aiming at if, if your goal is to speak in that manner? And the answer is, well, you have to be doing your best for the best in you and other people. That has to be your aim. And then you have to speak truth insofar as you're capable, and that will do the trick. And there's no difference between that and the paraclete that Christ left in the Gospels behind, behind after his departure. It's a reflection of the idea of the Holy Spirit. It's the baptismal spirit. It's the spirit of God that moves upon the waters at the beginning of time. It's, a, it's the creative manifestation of the structure that extracts habitable order from chaos. It's all of those things in its living form. That's why it's inspiring. Why else would it be inspiring? Why else would it attract and gleam, right? Or have motive force? Right. I mean, the, and, and you can think of it instinctually if you want. It speaks biologically. Those are words that speak to the deepest core of your being, materially, for that matter, because everything stacks up. If everything's unified in the highest place, everything stacks up. And, and that is the case. Right? That to me is the final test of an idea's validity, if it will stack and if it will point you to yeah, things that right. are true. Mm -hmm. That's this, technically yeah. true, by the way, because one of, so the reason that, you have five senses is so that your orientation occurs as a consequence of things that are stacked. Mm. When all five senses report the same thing, you have a reasonable assurance that what you're seeing corresponds sufficiently to reality so you won't perish. Right now, we, that isn't enough because then I'll take the evidence of my senses and contrast it with the evidence of yours from your slightly different perspective. And then we'll do that collectively. We're doing a lot of stacking in order to filter the infinite sufficiently so that we can model it well enough to move forward. A lot of stacking. And that is, there's a technical branch of psychometrics, uh, construct theory, that that psychologists have developed to help distinguish between concepts that are real from concepts that aren't, like the phrenological concepts, for example, that people used to use to map the hypothetical functions of the brain. There was something in that idea, but they weren't real concepts. How do you know if a concept is real? Well, you can measure it using multiple different instruments at different times and in different places and get the same report, it's something like that. Now, more than ever, the ability to see through the chaos of the traditional news media is an absolute necessity. Bias narratives, selective reporting, all of it obstruct the kind of informed, critical thinking that all of us should be striving for. That's why I have to tell you about Ground News. Ground News compiles stories from across the global political spectrum, giving you every angle so you get the full picture. You can see a story like the one here, which has been covered by more than 260 sources. What I find really interesting is that 36% of the sources lean left, 33% are in the center, and 31% lean right. Now, these are based on ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. And if you keep scrolling, you'll see every article about that topic. Another cool feature is the blind spot feed, which shows you stories that are disproportionately covered by only one side of the political spectrum. Go to ground.news slash Tom and sign up. Subscriptions start at just $1 a month, or you can get 40% off unlimited access via the Vantage subscription. Check out Ground News and stay informed, guys. I am very impressed by this service and I hope you guys will give it a shot. Mm. Right, right, right. This is why the case against you scares me. This is people with dead ideas uh, enslaving others with bumper stickers, slogans mm -hmm. that they can hold on to that makes them feel morally virtuous. Mm -hmm. But they they're are not... simple. They're simple and morally virtuous. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a viciously tempting combination. Right? Correct. One idea explains everything. Plus, once you brandish that idea, all your moral work is done. Mm. Right? Very, very tempting. That is definitely the tempting. That is definitely the temptation of a deadly slogan like from each according to his ability to each according to his need. You can destroy the world with that dead weapon. Yeah. And we, you know, <laughs> we did a pretty good job of trying that. And we're not done. 
apparently yeah. yeah so uh this is why i think you have to be from their lens you have to be silenced because you force that idea to compete for validity in the realm of ideas mm -hmm. and if it really is ideas it, and well, that's all we have if it doesn't compete in the realm of ideas it will compete in the realm of flesh yes right Everyone needs to know that. And its unwillingness to compete in the realm of ideas is a signal that it's not valid, which is why they can't put, is exactly why Biden saying, I'm not gonna debate scares the life out of me because mm -hmm. that's what you do when you can't win. Like if mm -hmm. you know your ideas are more compelling, you step to the mic all day long. Or if you know that you should subject them to debate. So if you're wrong, you could learn. God, even right? better. Right, because maybe that's even what you want in a leader. You don't necessarily need a leader who's right, because God help you, you're not going to find that, but you could at least find one who is willing to put his ideas to the test to discover where he's wrong. Mm. That's a leader. That's someone with courage. Right? That's someone willing to kill the, to kill the father in a sense, to kill the tyrannical father, because the tyrannical father is the presumption of your own dead ideas. That, not psychologically speaking, that's the case. Mm. That's the giant that the hero slays in order to make the new world. Right, the dogma of the past, the dead dogma of the past. It might've even been valid at some point, but you want a leader who embodies that spirit and not necessarily the correct knowledge. Because, you know, Piaget, Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, he knew this, is that the deepest truth is a proper formulation of the process by which truth itself is generated. Right, and that's what Piaget was trying to discover when he evaluated children. He Say knew that, that again. The deepest I don't know if I can say that again. The deepest truth is the representation of the process by which truth itself is generated. That's the hero story. Wow. It's a process. Why truth is a process. Agree. Truth is a spirit rather than a set of dead facts. Why do people run from it? Because it forces you to pick up your cross. I mean, really, obviously, obviously. Like, why do people run is the question. Well, what do they run from? Pain and malevolence. Well, why? Well, <laughs> it's obvious why. They, what's not obvious is how you could not do that. Well, you know, the, the entire biblical corpus is an analysis of why you shouldn't run. What would mean not to run? What it would mean if you fully ceased running? That's the story of Christ. The story of Christ is the story of a man, the man, let's say, who ceased running. That's what it, that's what the story is. Can I give you an alternate take that scares me so badly? And I think I'm right about this. Okay. I think well, if it scares you, that's a good indication <laughs> that you might be right. Yeah. Uh, the, the big problem here is that to pick up a cross and be willing to suffer what Jesus suffered, mm. you have to, you have to have a conviction that you're right, that hell awaits on the other side of not doing that. Most people cannot think through ideas that complicated and be certain enough that they'd be willing to be torn down. Mm -hmm. Well, that's reflected that's to some degree. Need that's reflected to some degree in the structure of, especially the Catholic Church, and 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 Dostoevsky pointed to that in the Brothers Karamazov. There's a scene in the Brothers Karamazov where Christ comes back to Earth in the midst of the Spanish Inquisition, and he performs his miracles and goes about goes about his spiritual business goes about being the process of the word, and the inquisitor comes and arrests him and throws him in prison, and then comes down in the middle of the night and says, look, you know, we've, we don't need you around. You're a lot of trouble. We've taken your impossible message, your impossible demands, and we recast them so that flawed people can manage. And the last thing we need is you to show back up and destroy everything we've done to make what you had to say palatable because people just can't manage it. It's too much. Mm. And Christ listens and at the end he kisses the inquisitor who turns white and leaves, and, but he leaves the door open when he leaves. And, and that's, that's a complicated answer to your question, but you are right in a sense that it's too much to ask, but you're wrong <laughs> and that People turn to lesser solutions, mediated solutions, like a belief in an external Christ, let's say, that's, that's one way of thinking about it, rather than a joint belief in an internal and external Christ, which would be more 
comprehensive. And they turn to that instead of, of seeking out the whole adventure. The problem with that is, and this is the problem, is that you don't have a choice about your cross exactly. You only have a choice about how you will bear it because death and, and hell are coming for you. And that's that. There's no escape from that. And so all you can choose is the manner in which you confront it. And you can do it voluntarily, wholeheartedly, in good faith, with courage, or you can do it any of the insane multiplicity of other ways that clamor for your attention. That's right. My name is Legion, right? There's a, word, there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the, the Christian message, fundamentally, is that your best bet, all things considered, truly all things considered, is to take the whole burden on. Like wide eyes wide open, right? That's what Abraham does, for example, when he goes on his great adventure. It's the, it's a, and that's what Job does. There are precursors to this idea in the Old Testament stories. It's in some ways fully revealed. That's a good way of thinking about it in the New Testament stories. So Christ's claim is that he embodies the spirit in the Old Testament. You think that's right? I think that's the simplest explanation. And it's, it has to do, you said already that people can allow ideas to possess them. So what idea should you allow to possess you? Mm -hmm. Well, the insistence in the Judeo-Christian tradition is that you should invite in this, the spirit of your ancestors, the unified, monotheistic, creative, loving, kind, truthful spirit of your ancestors. Something's coming in, or a multitude of things. How about a diversity of things? How about a rainbow of things? or a plurality of things. What, under some united flag? The union of diversity. I don't think so. It's no wonder that we believe in the union of diversity when we believe that a man can be a woman. If we believe those things, there's nothing we won't swallow. No camel too big to go down our throats. No totalitarian lie we won't rush to embody. So you asked earlier, where are we headed? Like. Every single person is making up their mind about that. Well, they always have, but it's really evident at the moment. And it's going to become a lot more evident than it is. Because people are moving in the wrong direction? No, they've always done that, but not this fast. Interesting. Right? Because we're, you know, we're, 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 in, a, we're in a runaway cycle of, of transformation. And Yeah, I and think we're in a positive feedback loop where social media allows simplistic ideas we're to be We're in a lot imbibed. of positive feedback loops. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, I, I, the only solution I see is That's the fight the with better ideas. That's the dragon that eats its own tail, <clears throat> the positive feedback loop. Hmm. We interpret the Ouroboros differently. Hmm. Well, uh, it's many things, you know, because it is a symbol of chaos, but one yes. of the things it is is a runaway positive feedback loop. Interesting. I see that as... Um, the what ends up happening when you don't have the right foundational model yeah, definitely. that you can't make progress because mm -hmm. your core foundation is such that you eat your own progress yeah through sure. incompetence is the easiest way to think of it you have mm -hmm. the wrong model that's to me what the ouroboros is about which is the whole idea that you're well, that's saying why about, it emerges when the father dies you know because much better it's the than I. yeah if the if the father is a corpse the Ouroboros makes itself manifest. The Mesopotamians knew this. When, when the, okay, so the Mesopotamian gods killed their father, Apsu, and tried to live on his corpse. Well, that's what we're doing when we mouth slogans. We're trying to live on the corpse of the past. And in, instead of embodying its living spirit, they try, they slay the past. They're, they have no regard for the past, which is also what we're doing, by the way. They slay the past and attempt to inhabit its corpse, like Geppetto in The Whale. It's mm. the same idea. And Tiamat shows back up. She's the dragon of chaos. And, she, and her goal is to destroy everything. And that's one of the precursors. That idea is one of the precursors to the flood myth. And the word Tiamat is, they say, etymologically cognate with the word tohu vabohu. And that's the chaos out of which God makes order at the beginning of time. All these ideas are linked. So if you inhabit dead ideas, you will bring back chaos. 
of course, the dead idea, yes, the dead ideas can no longer, they can no longer sustain you in your active contending with the present. This happens in the Lion King. What happens when Scar takes over the pride? What, what happens when Scar takes over Pride Rock? Mm. Pride Rock, it's so comical. Scar takes over Pride Rock. Well, why? Well, he's scarred. That's the first thing. He's intellectually arrogant, obviously. And the whole kingdom turns into a wasteland, a dry, sterile, desert wasteland. That's always the case. It's always been the case. And, and we're seeing the archetypal outlines more clearly now because things are changing at an ever-accelerating rate. And so God only knows what does Jonathan Pajot say? Giants will walk the earth once again. They already are. What is the enlightenment? Why do we have to get to the other side of it? Or why do you think maybe we already the are? The enlightenment is the belief that the material world speaks for itself. And it's not true. You have to see facts through a lens of value. The postmodernists got that right. That's why we are in the culture war to some degree, is the postmodern critique was correct. We see the world through a story. And the facts now indicate that. I've, I've talked with Carl Friston, for example, one of the world's great neuroscientists. Many people know this now. Um, I asked Friston, is, a, is an object a micro-narrative? He said, yes. So because even we have your, to understand what to do with it. Function, you bet, you bet, you bet, you bet. You don't just see the world. You see the value of the world. And you don't, you don't see the world and infer the value. You see the value. You see the value. And, and the, the implicit structure of your unconscious is the, is the matrix of value through which the world reveals itself. And properly formulated, that matrix has a multidimensional narrative structure that's coherent, that's reflected in the structure of the biblical stories. And we know that, but what we say, well, what's the foundational document of Western civilization? Well, obviously, it's the Bible. Like, forget the theology, historically. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that, it means it's the seed from which your perceptual matrix grew. You're a more or less coherent echo of the biblical corpus. That's what you are. And the more you know of the stories, the hyperlinked stories, the more fully fleshed that incarnation, internal incarnation becomes. The Bible was written in consort, you might say, with the, obviously, with the function of the human nervous system, both individually and collectively, it was woven together over thousands of years and also evolved to match the structure of our memories, all of that, and the structure of our attention. So the postmodernists, when they realized that we saw the world through a story, which was a brilliant discovery and was made in many disciplines at the same time, by the way, um, they, jumped to the, they jumped to the next question, which was, well, if we see the world through a story, what is the story? And they said, well, it's power and it's twin sister, it's evil twin sister, hedonism, but power. They were Marxists. It's all about power. So have it your way. Play with fire. See what happens. Power. I think power is interesting too, because you might say, well, why would you want power? Like if I could just ask you to walk along with me, why wouldn't I do that? Why would I have to exercise power over you? Well, how about I want you to do something that you don't want to do? Well, what? How about something for my immediate gratification? That's why... Pajot, Jonathan Pajot, has said that the Marquis de Sade is the evil brother of the Enlightenment rational mind. It's like, absolutely. Same thing, same idea explored by Dostoevsky in, in Crime and Punishment with Raskolnikov. Yeah. Brutal. <laughs> All right. So Brutal. let me say, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, that to get on the counter enlightenment train, we could sum it up in a tongue in cheek way and say facts are dead. Facts are always dead. Facts are always dead. That's why you can't follow them. There's as many, there's more facts than there are things. You can't orient yourself. Imagine I drop you in the middle of a desert. It's like all the facts are at hand, man. You're still gonna die. 
Why? Because the because the territory isn't the map. Because the land doesn't speak. How about that? How about all of that? Right? No. Can I give you my favorite example of this? Sure. Okay, this is true. Uh, what we think of as the entire world, everything that we can see is 0.00035% of the available electromagnetic spectrum. Right, right, good example. So looking at you, I should see a number of photons in a given wavelength that are reflecting off of that fabric, but I don't. I see black, I see red, I see gold, whatever. You see tools and obstacles. Uh, yes, for mm -hmm. sure. And once I understood, oh my God, I'm seeing a ridiculously gross simplification mm -hmm. of what is really in the world, then I realized my brain is made up of algorithms. And once I realized my brain is made of algorithms and algorithms are designed to push you to see certain things, to conceive of them in a certain way, mm -hmm. I suddenly really wanted to understand yeah, what are right. my algorithms driving me to do? And every That's idea for sure. that we- That's why Jung said every person has to figure out the myth that they're living. Whoa. Hmm. Whoa. Mm, it's the same thing. Yeah. What I like story? That. Here's two ways of thinking about it. What story are you acting out? Or what character resides in you? That's another way of thinking about it. Or what spirit have you allowed to possess you? Or what spirit have you invited in and consorted with su such that it can possess you? So when Cain is bitter, Cain from Cain and Abel, Cain is bitter because his sacrifices go unrewarded. So he's bitter because his work is not successful. And everyone should be able to identify with that. There's no difference between work and sacrifice, by the way. They're the same thing. We, when we work, we sacrifice the present to the future. Saw that so, clip from your book. Yeah, okay, okay. So now Cain's work is unsuccessful, so he gets bitter. And so, and he's jealous as well of Abel, whose sacrifices are accepted and who's thriving. And so Cain... Cain's countenance falls. He becomes depressed and anxious and nihilistic and resentful and starts to shake his fist at God. He, did, he does what Job's wife tells Job to do when Job is being tortured. Job's wife says, shake your fist at God and die. Well, Cain shakes his fist at God and kills. And so that's, that's even worse. Um, so Cain calls out God, just like bitter atheists do constantly. And for, they have their reasons and says, you know, I'm, what the hell's going on here? What kind of world did you make where I'm breaking myself in half with my labors and nothing is succeeding and everything is bitter and pointless. And God says, if you did well, you, you'd be accepted. And then he says something much, much worse, which you figured out already. He said, sin crouches at your door like a sexually aroused predatory animal, and you've invited it in to have its way with you. That's dark. Right. Well, it's terrible. It's terrible. And there's echoes of this in other mythological stories. Uh, so what it means is that Cain is suffering, and there's, there's nothing sinful in that as such, right? Because the innocent can suffer. Cain suffers, and then he turns in the direction of temptation. He starts to nurse his resentment. That's another biological metaphor to nurse your resentment he starts to brood over his resentment right and so what that means is that spirit of arrogant resentment takes he invites it in it takes up residence within him but then he engages in a creative he engages in a creative dialogue with that spirit it's it's not merely possession it's it's joint cons, it's conspiracy it's conspiracy between the eternal spirit of darkness, that's a good way of thinking about it, and the living human soul. That's what happens when you get resentful. Man, when I hear you talk, this is, uh, this is exactly what it feels like to me. Um, J.K. Rowling, the first Harry Potter book, mm. is really simple. And by the last one, it's heavy. And mm -hmm. she was clearly maturing the writing and the story with the people reading it. Mm -hmm. When I look at we who, yes, when I look at we who wrestle with God as the more mature next step in the 12 rules of life, uh, it's sort story, of a return to maps of meaning. Interesting. So you don't be. feel that it's the successor to 12 rules of life. It is in the way that you just described, because I, think, I suppose it's a hybrid. See, maps of meaning was so difficult. It's, it, it took me 30 years to unpack it to the point where I could make it 
straightforwardly comprehensible, especially in writing, but even in, in lecturing. I, I unpacked it really over 30 years. Mm -hmm. and then I got good enough at that so I could write a book that was accessible. And then this book is, I hope it retains its accessibility, but it's, it's a hydrogen bomb, this book. Really. I mean, look, I haven't read it yet, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant a flag here and say this is how I think your books go. Uh, Maps of Meaning, which is how I found you, um, helped me understand why. Why were you motivated to plow through that? Because I'm a filmmaker at mm. my oh, yes. core. Oh, yes. So the story uh, part. Yes. And so I took away from that. This is why these structures, these characters, these relationships, this is why they resonate with the human animal. Yes, right, right. 12 rules for life were... Hey, I see you suffering. I see nobody's talking to you. Let me give you some simple rules that will really help you out. Mm -hmm. Then you go on your own cross carrying journey, coma, illness, crazy town, and you come back with the Deathly Hallows version of now I'm going to give you these, the mythology, and I'm going to tell you exactly what you wrestle with to learn what spirit not only lives inside you currently, what spirit should live inside of you. All of the human experience has already been thought through. I can't give it to you in a bunch of simple packages of the rules for life because those will become dead wood fast. I've got to get you into the thing. There is a reason you titled this book, We Who Wrestle With God and not What You Can Learn From God. That, that mm -hmm. would have been a title more people would have understood. But there's obviously something to this idea of wrestling with living ideas, making it personal, figuring out what your relationship is with this stuff. When, 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 when Jacob is wrestling with God, that's worship. That's, that's true worship. That's why he, he's awarded the name Israel. He's the leader of the chosen people because he wrestles with God. So... That's uh, manna for the suffering, because it means that if you're genuinely suffering, then you're, God's there in your grasp, right there with you. That's a good way of thinking about it. In the wrestling. Um, Socrates was a wrestler, literally, mm. right? And, he was, he was a very powerfully built person. He wrestled before he was a philosopher. It's the same thing. And everyone, the thing is about the chosen people of Israel, everyone wrestles with God. Now the question is, you know, in what spirit should you wrestle with God? And I would say, um, remember who you're wrestling with. That's what Job, that's what God tells Job when he reminds him that, you know, God was there at the beginning of the time, beginning of time. Um, defeating Leviathan, fashioning the world. Remember who you're wrestling with. Have a little humility. Or a lot. Plenty. Enough to strip you of your dead wood. Right. And if you're all dead wood, then the fire of God looks like hell. Can I get you to read something that you said? These are your words, uh -oh. verbatim. This is from your ARC speech. Mm. This was when I felt like, okay, I actually really understand what he's doing now. Uh, it starts there with the muscle emojis uh, and just goes you to the bottom. You want me to read it out loud? Yeah, I think it's better in your voice because this, this, for everybody listening, this is part of the speech he gave at the ARC conference. We're so foolish. We regard those propositions, religious propositions, as something approximating primitive superstitions, when in fact they're the most brilliant intuitions into the fundamental structure of reality that have ever been offered. We predicated our civilization on those presuppositions. And look at it. It's not so bad. We've brought wealth and plenty to billions of people around the world. We've been struggling uphill properly. And if we were wise and faithful and courageous and responsible, we could continue to spread that to everyone. We could eradicate absolute poverty. We could bring about a time of abundance and opportunity for everyone. And we'll do that. We can do that if we hoist the world on our individual shoulders and operate collectively in this harmonious manner and continue the struggle uphill toward the city of God. And that's the truth. It's the truth. It's not some superstition. It's not some primitive defense against death anxiety. It's not the opiate of the people. 
It's the call to divine responsibility and to the degree that each of us acted it out in the confines of our own life, we do what I suggested at the beginning of this conference, which is tilt the world toward heaven and away from hell. Yeah, that's... that's All right. That's, Amazing. It hit me very hard when I first heard it. I don't believe in God. Hmm? How do I come to What does Pajot say about that when people say that? He says, I don't believe in the same God you don't believe in. <laughs> Do you think, are you struggling to find your way? Yes. Is it an honest struggle? Yes. That's the belief. It's not a statement. <laughs> Religious belief is not a statement about facts. It's not a scientific theory. This is why the enlightenment is, is done. That, that was wrong. That isn't what it is. It's a struggle. It's, it's the moral struggle. Or you could say, Maybe more clearly. See, you say you don't believe, but what you mean is you can't reconcile your conceptions with your intuitions, really. And that is the modern predicament. Because you do you believe that what happened in Auschwitz was wrong? Yes. Okay, well then, you know, you've established one pole of the, of the belief in divinity. You've just established the malevolent pole. And that means the benevolent pole is ill conceptualized still implicit that's it still implicit that's what god is that's what god is in in the belly of the whale is implicit still implicit but that doesn't mean it's not there called or not called god is there that was carl jung the carving over his the castle he built with his own two hands it's there you just don't know it but you know to some degree because you're struggling and you're struggling away from auschwitz let's say that's good you great you know the person running away from hell is also running towards heaven now maybe your pathway would be a little straighter if you knew a little bit more about heaven but away is something out of hell is something out of hell towards what there's the next question i suppose out of hell towards what towards what toward toward a neutral a neutral normality or or upward away from hell, up Jacob's ladder towards the highest possible heights. That's the dwelling place of the eternally uniting spirit. That's a good way of thinking about it. That's Jacob's ladder. And where does it end? I don't know if it does end. It, it disappears into the heights. And what's at the top? Something that recedes when you approach it. I come at everything from a very materialist mm. standpoint. Mm. Not uh, everything. I think everything. Not the evil. Not your realization of the reality of evil. Oh, uh, to me, that there's no incongruence there. That that's just a I, nature. I didn't of biology. say there was necessarily an incongruence. Um, interesting. So for me, that's the same. I come at that. Just humans are algorithms, and you have algorithms that could lead you to evil. I get why, in certain circumstances, in a truly amoral universe. Where the humans are the creators of algorithms as well. Yeah, sort of. There's look. Yeah, sort of. That's right. Biology sort of. is uh, is at play, but females select who they sleep with, and that has huge implications. We all get to invite ideas into our world, so for sure. Um, well, there's an order. It's like I think one of the ways of thinking about good thinking about it is that it's the same as the dynamic between musical knowledge and musical production in composers. Like the composers are adhering to a set of guidelines, you would say. They're, they're, they're operating in accordance with a certain order, but they can produce an endless, literally endless proliferation of forms. And human beings are both of those things. They're, they're the order that gives rise to gives rise to what is new and alive, but they're also the thing that is alive. They're both at the same time. That's the hero in 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 relationship to the the father of the king that's osiris in relationship to horus or that's horus sorry horus the egyptian god in relationship to osiris we're both that's partly why there's a trinitarian view in christianity so because there's a there's a 
the father is like a structure that's a way of thinking about it and the son is the son is the incarnation of that structure and the spirit is the intermediary between the two it's something like that I'm trying to get people to understand that they're having a biological experience because I want them to be able to predict the outcome of their actions by understanding the nature of their mind and the minds of the people they're interacting with. I have a feeling you're doing exactly the same thing through a different form of encapsulated wisdom, that wisdom being the biblical corpus. Mm -hmm. How right does that feel? Well, the monotheistic hypothesis is that everything meets. So I don't have any problem with the everything evolutionary meets. biologists, for example. Well, the, once we sort out our theological presuppositions and our biological presuppositions, they'll be the same thing. Yes. Mm. Oh, yes. You can see that. That that convergence is already happening. Mm. That's already happening in many, many ways. There's There's a tremendous concordance, I would say, between the ethos that's laid out in the biblical writings and uh, the, uh, what would you say, the analysis of reciprocal altruism. So, and you know, Brett Weinstein is moving rapidly down that road, for example, in his conceptualization of the spirit that organizes human individuals and, and societies. So, Do you think what they're discovering is that the narrative structure and the just time-tested way that these stories have been passed on uh, into our generation um, prove that that's just the best encapsulation of that wisdom in a way that people can use yeah, in their yeah. own lives. Yeah, well, sure, sure. You could, you could almost think about that as by definition. I mean, the stories in the biblical corpus are the ones that burn themselves into our imagination and memories. Well, why? Well, because they have a concordance with that structure. The stories, this is where Dawkins would have gone with the idea of meme if he would have pushed it eventually. The memes that best match themselves to the structure of our psyche are the ones we conserved. Yes. Obviously. How could it possibly be any different? How could it possibly be any different than that? Obviously, that's the case. That obviously assumes a base assumption that you will react the most strongly to the things that are most true. If you don't right. have that base assumption, you won't. That won't be obvious to you. You'd be like, "It's not real, therefore it's bullshit," and you will completely right. well, discredit well, the emotional oh, yeah. response. Well, yes, yes, I said. Because I if you take a Sam Harris or a you Richard can do Dawkins, that when you're confused conceptually, though, too, and that can block your vision. So, and and that's what's that's part of what happened as a consequence of the Enlightenment. We we didn't understand what we were doing. And we didn't understand the relationship between what we were doing and the world of facts. But it was super useful, man. What the yes. enlightenment? Absolutely, absolutely. Why Definitely. did it break down? Why does it fall apart? Because the world of facts doesn't speak. Because the empirical hypothesis is wrong. Will you give me that it's like Newtonian physics versus Einsteinian physics, where it's so close, it gets you so far. But then ultimately it falls down and you realize there's a whole universe to be unlocked. There's, there's, an, there's a reasonable analogy there. The, the problem is it's like the fall of the science ideas, that science isn't an animating spirit. It's not a guide. Hmm. And so you, the, the world of facts, see the empirical hypothesis is that we derive all our information from facts. It's, it's, not, it's just not the case. That's not I'm going to change that word for you, and I think it will help you get to what people are trying to say. It's utility. That's, yeah, it's utility. Pe that's value. Who cares about facts? It's mm. utility. What yeah. I'm trying to get people that's to understand is... That's what the American is, pragmatists figured out in the yes. late 1800s. Yes, So, But right. you were saying people look at the world, and they see they don't see a water bottle. They see I can quench my thirst. They mm. see the utility. So someone, mm. I'm putting words in their mouth, and I don't know them well enough... But like, if I were to sit down with Sam or Dawkins, I have a feeling where where they buck is, I don't need the encapsulation of wisdom in this story that I've seen kill millions of people throughout history yeah, when that, people even disagree. That, even that's 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 a very see. Both Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins identify the totalitarian spirit with the religious spirit, and that's a failure of discrimination <laughs> on their part. They're not the same thing. The religious spirit can be perverted by the totalitarian spirit, but that doesn't make it identical to it. That's exactly what the postmodernists claim when they talk about the... It's exactly the same claim that the postmodernists are making about systemic racism, is that the system itself is nothing but an embodiment of oppressive power. 
It's exactly what Harris and Dawkins say about the religious domain. It's a precisely the same claim. And it's not true. It's not true. When religious ideation is perverted, it perverts in the direction of power. But the truly religious have known that forever. I mean, Christ himself is crucified by the people who use the religious enterprise as a means to power. That's the Pharisees. This, is, this isn't new. So, now can, can the religious enterprise be perverted by those in power? Well, obviously, the most effective psychopaths use what is highest to serve what is lowest. But they will also smuggle things into the works that were convenient and useful at the time to justify conquest, whatever. Oh, sure. And then that stays in the adherence of that philosophy, that religion, then do some pretty horrible shit. Like it's easy to understand where Sam is coming from, especially with Islam, when somebody does a thing that we consider pretty heinous and they point to the book and say, I did it because it says to do this in that, then yes, well, now it requires, you've got- It requires particularly careful separation of the wheat from the chaff to get those things straight. Yeah. And is this why you say we wrestle with God? We're not just taking every word of the Bible uh, on its face. We are pulling from you it. You can't. You can't take every word on its face. It's not even technically possible because the meaning of each word is dependent on, well, the word, obviously, mm -hmm. but the history of the word, and then the history of the word insofar as you've encountered it, and then the word in that phrase, and then the phrase in that sentence, and then the sentence in its paragraph, and then all of the relationships between all of those levels and all the other sentences and paragraphs in the whole book. Like, it's not like you can point to the facts in the Bible. I mean, that just doesn't work because the Bible's actually the structure through which, the reason it doesn't work is because the biblical corpus is a representation of the structure through which facts are interpreted. It's not the facts themselves, it's a deeper form of truth. It's a deeper form of truth. Okay, well, well, well. it's Let the me say truth something. through which truth is seen. Okay, yeah. um, I think what I hear you saying is uh, you need the narrative because the narrative forces a hierarchical structure to the facts that are being discussed. And without that, Perceived even. It, it gives you a, a framework with which to order the facts that you're trying to deal with so That's that right. you don't have to reinvent that. Uh, sequencing mm -hmm. of hierarchical alone. Um, facts right? alone by yourself. Right? Well, it also time. gives you protection against the false consensus of the group. Whoa, say that again. Well, look, people might say, <clears throat> they, they might say, well, our knowledge is only a social construct, and then maybe they mean truth by consensus. Mm -hmm. You know, so let's assume that there's a world of facts that you can orient yourself in. We'll just leave that as an assumption for now. And then we'll say, well, people come to truth by consensus. It's okay. Well, what, what if the consensus is the Nazi consensus? Well, then either that's a transgression against a more fundamental truth, or it's just a variant of an infinite number of equally valid consensual truths. Well, you can go down that morally relativistic pit if you want, but that's a form of hell because eventually the logical culmination of that mode of thinking is that there's no value distinction between things, in which case you can't even move forward because you only move forward towards something better. Mm. And so it just leaves you bereft. Now, the alternative is to say, well, there is a central core of hierarchical truth and that to some great degree that's embedded in tradition, in which case we can use tradition as the staff, the the, the flagpole, let's say, like Moses' staff, which is exactly what Moses' staff represents, by the way, that's the tradition around which even our consensus must revolve, right? And that's the conservative insistence. That's one way of thinking about it, is that there's a vertical axis of orientation upward towards God mediated by tradition, and there's a horizontal axis that it's that's part of the ongoing conversation and consensus of the moment. But you've got to ask yourself, and you already have asked this question. It's the question Solzhenitsyn posed. If everyone has gone insane, if everyone's possessed by the lie, well, first of all, to make that claim is, is also to make the assumption that there's some truth that's now being ignored. But then on what grounds does the man who is honest stand? 
because it's obviously not on the grounds of consensus because the consensus is the lie. That's the nature of a totalitarian state, right? When the consensus becomes the lie, you're in a totalitarian state. And that it, obviously it implies, indicates more directly that there's a truth. There's a truth outside of that. Now, the truth is a process rather than a statement of facts or even a statement of faith. You know, and partly because, partly because of, the, of the mode of enlightenment thinking, we think, even Christians think, and probably especially Protestants, not that I'm singling out the Protestants because that wouldn't be fair, that, you know, to believe in Jesus is to say a set of facts and then say you believe them like they're a scientific theory. Well, you're missing the point, which is what the Orthodox Christians have been trying to tell the Protestants for a very long time, and the Protestants know this to some degree. The point is the imitation of Christ. That's the ultimate expression of faith. It's not proclam... It can also be proclamation of a set of beliefs, but that's not what it is fundamentally. When you say faith, what do you mean? Faith that it will work? Faith is what you bet your life on. Uh-huh. But that's a definition. I well, worry and, that a lot of people bet their life on that this is really true because then they can just spout the yeah, bumper well, stickers fine. and they can shut the argument they're down. Also, they're, you're not just betting their life, they're betting their soul, right? That's worse. Hmm. That, that life, me, that, that <clears throat> disappears with death. You know, Let me play with an idea here really fast. Is it possible that part of what makes religion so useful is that even if you are uh, trying to treat it like a dead bumper sticker slogan, uh, that the wisdom that it encapsulates is so useful that even if you were just blindly doing it That's because God told you to do, yeah. that your life will be better than if you were to yeah. um, not, not. Well, yes, yes, and I would also say that even if you don't think so, your belief structure is permeated by the implicit beliefs. Dawkins believes in the truth. He believes in the redeeming power of the truth. Mm -hmm. He believes in the redeeming power of the communicated truth. Yeah. Well, there's no difference between that and worshiping the word, the divine word. It's the same thing. It, and it, if that wasn't the case, the scientific enterprise wouldn't have emerged out of the Christian ethos. Dawkins, though he doesn't know it, is mostly a Christian, and so is Harris. Now, Harris has drifted off into meditative space because he had to find a God that was so ineffable that his rational intellect could not tear it down. So that was Sam's solution. But the question is, why would he worry about his rational intellect tearing it down? It's only because, I think, well, and this is, this is one of the things I'm dealing with, which is if you ask me to believe that it is scientifically true, that everything in the Bible is literally correct, I'm done. Tapped out, finished, no way. Uh, a level of absurdity that I, I just can't even entertain. Like I, I couldn't look myself in the eye and be like, yeah, I actually believe it. Whereas if you say to me, hey, this is the ultimate encapsulation of wisdom. So if tradition is experiments that worked, I forget who said that, mm -hmm. but I think that's a right, lovely yeah, way to yeah, think it of is. it. That's a good one. Uh, if that's true, and this story is, has encapsulated these in a way that the human mind can absorb through the narrative, and that this has just withstood the test of time, that if you blindly believe this and act in accordance, your life will actually be made better. You could say the Exodus description is a very accurate description of what actually happened, but all the people who were there at the time were blinded by the facts. Blinded by the facts. Why do you say blinded by the facts? Well... How much, you already said, for example, that when you look, you use some trifling percentage of the available electromagnetic spectrum. Mm. Well, when you are anywhere doing anything, what fraction of what's going on in reality do you perceive? Well, I would say the biblical accounts of what happened are more accurate than the accounts of the people who would have, than the accounts we would have generated had we been there. There are the, a glimpse behind the scenes. That's another way of thinking about it. I, do, I don't want to spiral off from this. I want to know if you think this is really true because this may make your message access, accessible to people like me as one avatar uh, that it might not otherwise be that the mistake Sam is making is approaching God, which I will say is encapsulated wisdom in a narrative that you can pass through generations. It's the spirit of that wisdom too. Even, that's even better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... If he's turning his rational mind to it, mm -hmm. that is to lose the forest for the trees because now he's attacking the container and he's saying, ah, oh, but the, you told me the container was made out of wood, but it's actually made out of plastic, whatever. It's like, 
Does it matter? Like you got the thing in the container and the thing in the container is what works. Now I'm gonna say something really inflammatory and then I will shut up and let you respond. Uh, I have a feeling that a big part of why religion works is that it is the thing that it, at all levels of intellect works. Mm -hmm. It works for extremely smart people and it works for that's really right. dumb people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Whereas that's why Dawkins so much of it's does encapsulated. Not. That's, that's, you know, there's some real truth in that. Now Dawkins' response to that is, that's the most intellectually arrogant thing he's ever heard. But, but well, because, you know, oh, I see. So it, it's good for stupid people, but not like for smart people like me. You know, that's the position. I'm saying it's good for everybody. I know, I know, I know. But his response, I've heard him respond to that sort of thing. His response is that's intellectually arrogant. But Dawkins believes that, Dawkins believes that people can easily become scientists. And they can't. Like science, Jesus. I know lots of scientists. I know lots of people who call themselves scientists. Not very many of them are scientists. Scientists are as rare as prophets. Hmm. They're rare. Now, you know, you've got people tinkering around the edges and sometimes they, you know, move things a trifle, but someone genuinely devoted to the truth in that sort of monastic manner that requires total commitment. You know, Dawkins is probably one of those people. You know, he's tangled up in his own I don't, I don't want to get, you know, high on my horse here. I like Richard Dawkins and I, and I learned a lot from his writings and he got a lot right. You know, I mean, he is the last standing avatar of the rationalist spirit. That's a good way of thinking about it. The enlightenment spirit and in some ways more power to him, but his, his view of the religious enterprise, it's biologically absurd. Like it's, it's not a functional view on from his own perspective. And I know that partly because, first of all, he knows that a biological organism has to be a microcosm. And second, he came up with the idea of meme. The idea of meme is that far from the idea of archetype. Yes. It's the same thing. Correct. Yeah, well, he just, he got to the meme part, looked over the edge and thought, whoa, -ho, we're not going there. That's what people do. That's what psychologists always do, for example, when they encounter Jung. You have to explain what's happening now with LLMs and how they're finding the patterns and the language, because yeah. that that oh, really yeah. made me look at the, well, the biblical corpus in a new way. A absolutely. Well, I think that we'll be able to use the large language models. Where I'm, I've <laughs> tongue in cheek established a new scientific discipline with a former student of mine, uh, Victor Swift, who now works with me and works on large language models, which we've been playing with a lot. Mm. Computational epistemology. So he's found a set of 10 words that functionally replace the notion of God in the English language corpus. What so, are the 10 words? I don't know all 10 of them to tell you the truth, but you know, you can imagine. So imagine God is the shared variance of words such as good, true, beautiful, mm. just, merciful. Interesting. Right, right, right. So then imagine that God dies. So that center word disappears. Yeah. But the spirit's embedded in the cloud of concepts. Mm. Well, that the cloud of concepts around a given concept is the archetype, the central, sorry, the central tendency of a cloud of related concepts is the archetype. Yeah. That makes I mean, sense. we can map it. We can map it now with the large language wants. Yeah, okay. it's stunning. That's really important for people to understand that, that in cracking, at least mimicking human intelligence in a way mm -hmm. where we can't distinguish the difference, what you're looking right. for are these <laughs> interconnected that's patterns. It. And well, well that's you... exactly, that's what the models do. That's mm. how they're trained, right? Is that they're trained on conditional probability, essentially, towards a goal. So you can tell a word, let's say a non-word like uh, nant, N-A-N-T, nant. That's a, uh, it's a non-word, but it's not, it's less of a non-word than Z-X-Q-R. Mm. Well, why? Well, because the statistical relationship between the letters in the word nant are more akin to English words than the statistical relationships letter to letter in the all consonant, other non -cons, all consonant non word. Okay, well, the large language models map the statistical relationship not only between letters, but between words, adjacent words, but then words two words away, words three years, words away, mm -hmm. two words, two, two words away from two other words, like the whole map, essentially. Right, right. And so, but they do that statistically. They do that mathematically. Hmm. So that would really what that means now is that if these models are programmed honestly, trained honestly, a very difficult thing to manage, then 
we can use statistics to evaluate the structure, the implicit structure of meaning. And that's what literary critics have been doing forever. And, you know, Harris, when he argued with me, he said, well, you know, you're just, that's just your interpretation, which meant of the biblical texts, for example, which turned him instantly into a postmodernist, right? There's an infinite number of interpretations of any text, and there's no canonical order between them. That's the postmodernist claim, the lack of meta narrative, let's say, which means there's no un un union. It means there's no comprehensibility. It means everything fragments ultimately, mm. which is what they wanted so they could dance in the runes and pursue their own short term gratification, right? With power as their, as their, as their hypothetical guardian and guide. Terrible, terrible. These interpretations aren't arbitrary. They're not arbitrary, they're coded into the language. That's what makes the language comp. Without that coding, their language would not be comprehensible. Now, the postmodernists even knew this to some degree because they knew. So, sir, he was he wasn't a postmodernist, but he was a precursor. He knew that the meaning of a word was coded in its relationship to other words. Now, it's more complex because it's the same for phrases and sentences and paragraphs. In the entire structure, has that. What would you say that network to that network nature, right? But none of that's arbitrary. And, and here's why it's not arbitrary. This is so cool. It's, it's not arbitrary partly because it has to be comprehensible to you and to me and to everyone else. So that's a terrible constraint, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it has to be a game everyone can play. So that's a really wicked constraint. One of those multidimensional constraints we were talking about earlier, but there's more to it. I had a vision of this this, this week about how this, and it's been developing for years, this idea. So imagine there's like a central pillar I envisioned it as a pillar of fire, with sort of God at the base of that. And then there are stacked disks of manifestation, material, imaginal, no, material, behavioral, imaginal, semantic, right? So the material world has an implicit structure that's captured in imagination. And so the world of images is going to have the same networked structure as the mm. world of words that the LLMs have modeled. Soon the LLMs will be able to model the world of images. And soon they'll be able to lay them on top of one another. And that's what we do because our semantic representation system is isomorphic with the underlying imaginal system. And that's isomorphic with the behavioral system. And that's isomorphic with the material system. And so there, and then the concordance between those is the truth of the claim. Right, so if it's true, it's true semantically, imaginatively, behaviorally, and it's reflective of the structure of the material world. Yeah. That's a tight set of constraints. There's nothing arbitrary about that. There's no, the meaning is only in the text. That's the ultimate claim of the disembodied, rational, prideful intellect. It's all in the words. It's like, no, no, no. Yeah, that, that to me is the punchline about what you're calling the counter-enlightenment mm -hmm. of uh, all of these patterns are present in the biblical corpus and that's how you mm -hmm. know it's a reflection. that it's that's mapped That's right, it's a reflect. Well. That's exactly right. It's a, it's, well, what the hell else do you think we've been doing for 4,000 years than trying to map this? That's what we've been trying to do with every tool at our disposal. Mm -hmm. Now, and you, but you pointed to a further constraint the representation has to be made manifest in a form accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, is that going to be in the form of complex scientific theories? No, that's the domain of specialists, obviously. Obviously, obviously. And besides that, even that specialized knowledge, you can't use that to orient you in the world. There's no reason to assume that your you know, typical evolutionary biologist is any wiser you know, than your typical plumber, mm. often far less. At least the plumber is constrained, you know. <laughs> the world of constraints that a plumber operates in, that's a pretty tangible world. You're wrestling with the essence of material reality, that's yeah. for we, sure. We who wrestle with pipes. Mm, yeah. Yes, definitely, definitely. Well, and plumbers, you know, I would say, there's, it's hard to uh, imagine a profession that has contributed more to the world than plumbers. Mm. How often are you checking your credit score, afraid of identity theft or account breaches? We all use the internet every single day for important things like personal banking and remote work. So why not protect yourself with our sponsor, Aura? 
Aura is an all-in-one cybersecurity service that keeps you safe online. Aura identifies data brokers exposing your info and submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Aura also monitors your credit, tracks your passwords for data breaches, and secures your online activity with VPN and anti-malware protection. You can try Aura for free for two weeks by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. Right. So. All right. This this whole idea I find utterly profound. Um, I worry though we're in a super weird moment. You are you're a canary in a coal mine for me in terms of freedom of speech and the Overton window, what people are allowed to say. Mm -hmm. um, the the authoritarian game only works if there's nobody there to challenge the ideas. You refuse to go away, but you're proving hard to kill, but they have certainly tried. Most people are very easy to kill in the world of ideas. They can shut down their career and make it impossible for them to make money, which mm -hmm. then makes other people just way too afraid to speak. Mm -hmm. I get it. You know the hell that awaits on being silent, but most people don't. And honestly, the hell comes so slowly that most people are like, well, this is just a little bit of hell by being silent, a little bit more, a little bit more, well, a little bit more. Well, it's deferred hell. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And well, deferred hell is deferred hell is eternal hell. That's not good. It it's is not good. And it I'd rather good. just have the hell like now. Yes, but you are very, yeah. very rare. And so there's two things I want to see if we can get to the other side of using what the um, counter enlightenment is going to teach us. Okay, so one, I I spend a lot of my time absolutely freaked out about the authoritarianism that I see creeping in. As somebody who grew up in the 80s, like this is just it's whiplash. Rampaging in. Yeah, it, it's insanity. Oh yeah. And it scares yeah. me because yeah, there's people yeah. telling me I can't 700 think. million CTTVs in China. Jesus, man. Yeah, they have full gate recognition, right? The so fact even they if have you're locked masked, down knives in people's houses, oh, yeah. what? <laughs> That's really yeah. scary. That well, that freaks all me out. Tyrants the way are don't petty. Understand. Yeah. Right. That's what makes them tyrants, right? Jesus. There'll be nothing that you there'll be no autonomy. That's the plan. Like zero. Mm. Zero autonomy. <laughs> Cause you know, well, and if if you if you haven't done anything wrong, you'll you'll have nothing to worry about. Uh -huh. It's like, yeah, well, good, great. Find me someone who hasn't done anything wrong, who has nothing to worry about. Yeah, right. So how do I heard at one point you were spending like ninety thousand dollars a month fighting everything yeah. that's coming at you? Um, that's crazy. So how do people who just absolutely cannot do that? How do they push back? Substitute and substitute adventure for security. Okay. Security. It's like you're going to pursue security. Are you? You. How's that going to work? You're, you're going to die. You're going to encounter malevolence. Like you can, you can defer the, the encounter to some degree, although not very successfully, there's no security. And, and then the thing is, that's the thing that's so interesting to understand is you don't want security. You're not an infant. That's not what you're after. You're actually after adventure. So where do you find your adventure? Aim up, tell the truth, and <laughs> adventure will come your way. And then that's so much better than security that there's no looking back. It's so incredibly exciting. It's, it's uncharted territory. The thing about the truth is that you don't know what's going to happen when you utter it. You have to let go. You know, so if I could come in here, you know, calculating what I want from this interview, figuring out how it's going to increase my social status or make me more money. And I mean, if it does those things, okay, but that's not the aim. The aim is to come in here and have a wrestling match. And why? Because I have faith in the outcome. So what's the faith? The faith is whatever happens to you when you tell the truth is the best thing that could happen, no matter how it looks to you. That's a statement of faith. Now, there's an alternative statement, which is, oh, no, no, no. I'll say something and there'll be a consequence. And I'll have faith that that consequence is the defining, what would you say, defining feature of that utterance. I said something, I got in trouble, therefore I shouldn't have said it. It's like, well, what if you get in trouble, but like three weeks later, everything's way better for you? Christ, like, it's not like there's any shortage of things like that in life. Mm -hmm. That's what work is. Work is, I'm going to do this thing now that's difficult. 
so that something better will happen in the future. Well, truth is like, truth is the ultimate investment in that matter. Definitely. That's why truth is what stores up treasure in heaven. That's what that means. And so, so how can people, how can people learn this? Try telling the truth. I mean, I wrote a chapter about this in one of my books that was quite accessible. It's like, start by not saying things you know to be a lie. Just start with that. Play with it. See what happens. See what happens. Walk me through the morning when that person does that. I'll talk to young men right now. Uh, they say what they think is true. They get fired from their job. They well, go then home. They, then they probably bit off more than they could chew, right? The eternal sin of Adam to bite off more than he could chew. It's like... You know, if you don't know what you're doing and you're in a dangerous place, maybe, you know, start on your knees, humbly, carefully. You know, don't go out there and brandish your new truth and make yourself into an idiot martyr so you can tell yourself that you're the Messiah, you know, with one utterance. That's not wise. You have to be as wise as serpents, right? That's the idea. This isn't a game. You have to, you have to do it with your eyes open, you know, and... If you pay attention, you'll see your opportunity. You'll see, you'll see. It'll make itself manifest to you. You'll see where there's a choice point where you'll be conversing with someone and you could take the easy route out that you usually take or you could dare right then and there. And there's an excitement about that. And then you'll try it. And, you know, the other person, you know, maybe you're kind of a cringing milk sop sort of person. And, and so you're, you're being intimidated by one of your friends who's actually a bully that you hate. And you decide at that moment that you're finally going to say at least a fraction of what you've been thinking. And, you know, it takes him aback. And then actually likes you better and is 10% less likely to bully you. Now, you might get punched too. You know, that's, well, hey. It's real. Like it's, that's right. This, this, is, this, this is real. It's, 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 it's the ultimate game. I suppose the ultimate game is what's real. But, but it's not like there's not consequences. One of the, the other thing you have to understand and this is a good thing for young men to understand is you're going to pay one way or another. There's no way out of that. So choose your method of payment. That's what you can do. And, and weirdly enough, if you choose the proper, God, if you choose the proper method of payment, the price you pay is, is one you would pay happily. That's what, that's why, see, Abraham is called upon to sacrifice his son, for example, and in the service of God. And he says yes, and then he doesn't have to. And that's right. And it's the same. We know this even in our families. A mother who will sacrifice her child to the world, let the child go, foster that child's independence, offer the child to be broken by the world, full-heartedly will get that child back, right? The child won't leave. So it's so interesting because the child leaves, but not really, right? Because that's the child who wants to maintain a relationship with the mother for the rest of the child's life, who wants that mother as a grandmother and who wants her around and who will return as much as is appropriate, but no more. And so everything you give away, you'll get back if you give it away in the right spirit. Mm. And we know that even on the reciprocal front, you know, I, I worked with many, many professors and, and society scientists, but let's say as a graduate student, I had a great graduate advisor, Robert Peel, who's still alive and who I still work with, that case in point. I loved working in Bob's lab, partly because he was insanely generous with his ideas. He'd just give them away. Like there were professors who'd like, they'd have an idea, so they'd shelter the damn thing. And it's like, this is my idea and someone's going to steal it. It's like, first of all, probably it's not your idea. Second of all, it's not that great anyway, so don't be so concerned. There's not a lot of people lining up to steal your ideas. And third, it's not that easy to steal ideas anyways. So there's a fair bit of arrogance and, and lack of faith in that. But imagine, we could even imagine psychophysiologically, what happens to you if you give away your ideas? So let's say, you know, you're blessed with a creative spirit and, and you're just giving your ideas away like mad, like you're a tree that's full of fruit and you're just distributing it. Well, everybody that you give an idea to is thrilled about it and they reflect that in their enthusiasm and that enthusiasm is rewarding and that reward creates a dopaminergic kick and that dopaminergic kick reinforces the dominance of the creative spirit and so then you have more ideas. Mm. Right. And this, so that's a great example of how you get back what you give away in spades. It's by far the best strategy. 
That's why Christ says that, you know, if someone asks you for, I don't remember the, this phrase exactly, but, you know, you give the person who asks your coat, you walk the mile with them. You give more than you're called upon to give, even to your enemies. Why? Because there is no better strategy than that by any stretch of the imagination. This is why there's such an emphasis in the Old Testament on hospitality. Be welcoming and productive generosity. Productive generosity. Well, what does that ensure? It ensures your own security, weirdly enough. Because if you give to a thousand people and then you're in trouble, you have a thousand people who are ready to help. You know, maybe you could give to a hundred thousand people or a million people. I mean, how could you possibly put anything in a more solid bank than in the goodwill you generated in the embodied imaginations of other people? Mm. That's the kingdom. That's the, that's the tre that's treasures in heaven. And they are an eternal form of treasure in some sense, not least because that reputation can last in some cases throughout the ages. And then it's, it's part of the manifestation of that underlying spirit of creative generosity that gives rise to the cosmos itself. The thing I don't want to get lost in all of that is that that is somebody who has a hierarchy of values, whether they got it religiously or they just decided it. But the hierarchy of values is what I would tell people to lean on in times of trouble. Yeah, they can't have just decided it. If they decided it, it's because something moved within them, mm. right? Because we just aren't self-created. You know, you know what I mean. I mean, we, we have that self-creative capacity to some degree, but right. we're the inheritors of one tradition or another or mishmash of traditions. Or We're socialized creatures, For intensely sure. socialized creatures. So there's all sorts of things that give rise to impulses within us. And so... I would say if someone technically atheistic is generous and productive in spirit, then they're infused with the word, regardless of what the semantic system sitting on top has to say about it. It's like, mm. I don't believe that. It's like, well, it kind of looks like you do, you know, if we're going to judge the tree by its fruits. And so Dawkins, you know, Dawkins doesn't know how much of a Christian he is. God, I want to sit you two down at the same time. I want to hear him respond to yeah, that he's, statement. He's a, he's a terrifying guy. You know, I've, I, the, unfortunately, the few times I have talked to him, I'm still quite ill. And um, you don't want to talk to Richard Dawkins when you're not at your best. And so, but I do believe that we are scheduled to have a public discussion at some point in the relatively near future. That so. would be amazing. Um, going back to young men, there's an idea that you put out there that I have talked about just ad nauseum. I'm so grateful to you for this concept. I hope you're right. That in the Bible, the idea that the meek shall inherit the earth makes no sense when you think of meek as weak. But when you think of meek as somebody who is a total badass, but they keep their sword sheathed, Rogan's a good example. Why? What's meek about Rogan? Well, it's not that he's weak. It's that he every guest he has, he he tries to learn from. You know, it's it it's a kind of there isn't anything more compelling and powerful than a well-armed humility. And I've seen this in great people. I've met I have been privileged to meet many great people. And I've met the shells of great people too. But the great people I've met are, they're striking in their humility. Striking. It's a core part of their character. And they're not, they're wrestling all the time. When they talk to someone, it doesn't matter who it is. They're, they're there with them, communicating. You know, one of the things we learned as we moved along on this tour was I have security people who also help me with logistics and uh, we've had to be very careful about who we gather around us because all the people on the tour have to treat everyone they come into contact well with well all everyone especially the people who come to my shows but in restaurants in hotels like I don't want to leave uh, this is especially true if you're in the public eye because if if you're unknown and you offend someone, they'll forget it. But if you're well known and you offend someone, they will never forget it. Mm. It will burn itself into their imagination, and they will tell absolutely everyone. They're, they'll feel deeply betrayed, and and they have been. So so we ensure that everyone around us treats everyone not well in the manner that 
keeps reputation intact, but well. Not so that reputation stays mm. intact, but because it's the right thing to do. And that's a form of that meekness, you know? It's, it, that's, that's what it's referring to. Do you think men are being taught to be weak right now? Yes, definitely. What, oh, what? no, it's worse than being taught. They're being enticed toward that in every way. Tell me more. And punished for not doing it. Well, they're enticed towards it by, well, well, the insistence, for example, that there are modes of less worthy being than the masculine, let's say, because masculinity itself is toxic to its core, a manifestation of patriarchal oppression, that male ambition is nothing but a manifestation of the force of tyrannical power that not only oppresses the oppressed, but rapes the world. Jesus, brutal. So there's that. So that, and then any deviation from, any deviation in that direction, the desire of a four-year-old boy to play with guns, for example, well, we have to rub, rub that out. It's like, oh, well, do you? You're going to rub out your son's ability to point and shoot, are you? That's, that's what he'll do his whole life. You're going to go to war with that in your feminine virtue. Toxic masculinity. It's like great harpy warfare. It's awful. It's awful. You know, but it's it's part of this belief and that's derived from this unholy nexus of agreement between the postmodernists and the meta-Marxists that the only story is one of power and men wield the power and therefore all masculine virtue is identical to the striving for power and that's immoral in its essence. It's basically the most pathological brandishers of that doctrine presume that male virtue is indistinguishable from malevolence. And so the best you can do if you're a man is to castrate yourself. And Oh, God. Well, what, that's what's happening in the culture. It's act literally happening. It's not even, it's not even symbolic. That's, that's the offering. That's the ultimate offering to the, to the great mother. That's a great way. Freud knew this. Jung knew this. This is mm. well mapped out. This is well mapped out in the psychological and, and symbolic spheres. You've asked a lot of people, I don't know if you've ever gotten a satisfying answer. I haven't heard it yet, but what happens when the left goes too far? Or pose, where, yeah, where does the left go too far? Mm. Yeah, yeah, what's well, the equity? I, I posed that to, it was either Brett Weinstein yeah. or his wife, Heather Hying. Mm -hmm. And because I said, look, what I see in the world right now is what it looks like when women become pathological, that the mm -hmm. things that oh, yeah. are good, nurturing, wanting to care for people, when that goes too far, and it, I, devouring mother would be your phrase, but it's a perfect phrase. Um, yeah, it That's really does. That's the sin of Eve. That's the eternal sin of Eve. To to even clasp the serpent to her breast. My compassion is so overpowering, there's nothing it can't incorporate. Mm. Even the fruit of, the, of evil itself. <laughs> that's the fall of man. Yeah, that's been playing out like in spades, rapidly, m miraculously. Yeah, it's very, very bad, very, very dark. So I know that if we don't find a way to um, make men, I won't even say strong, I think strong is a part of it, but... Invite them. Invite them to be strong. Invite mm -hmm. them yeah, to invite them. become what healthy masculinity looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, the question becomes, to, from where I'm standing, <clears throat> I will give you the image that I use a lot. I use this in business all the time. Uh, when things are getting really hard, I imagine myself in a loincloth covered in the blood of my enemies with a big fucking sword in my hand. Yeah. And that imagery helps me stay focused, mm -hmm. be strong, mm -hmm. be hard when I need to be hard. Not that I'm, you know, imagining killing indiscriminately, but that I need to be able to step into aggression. And aggression right, right, is the right, right word. Right, right, right. And mm -hmm. when I... Um, That's why Andrew Tate is so, so attractive to young men. Dude. So much. He's utterly fascinating to me. 90% of what he says scares me to death because it actually is toxic masculinity. But 10% is so good that I'm like, you cannot you know, well, dismiss this kid. Com people are complicated, eh? But the thing is, is that the, the more 
Okay, so, so the perversion of warrior in some ways is psychopath. And you know that because you watch like mafia movies. So we all know this, okay. But, but there's a dreadful attraction in untrammeled aggression for men who are so crushed that they're castrated. That's a good way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. so, so the attraction that the, that the Andrew Tate persona, let's say, has on those young men, there's actually a lot of that that's positive. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the right target, but it, there are creative ways of being wrong that are helpful. Right, right. Now, I, you know, you see better examples of that, precisely that in people like Jocko Willink and David Goggins and mm. Joe Rogan. Like these are tough guys, you know, but they're not. They don't have the sex appeal though. That's one thing I'll give Andrew Tate. Like, Yeah, he... but that's partly because they don't want it. Yeah, you see, fair. They, yeah, but it isn't that they couldn't have it. Like it's that they've, they've decided that everything in its proper place. Rogan mm. has a family, you know, so that's, that's where he's put it. And, and hey man, good work, good work to him. You know, and that sex appeal that Andrew Tate has, that's the sex appeal of the short-term mater. That's the psychopathic sex appeal. That's the dark tetrad sex appeal. It's shallow. It's shallow. And it will get him in trouble. I mean, it's already got him in trouble. Yeah. And so that's not going to, unless he, you know, wises up precisely that, it'll get him in trouble. You know, and I'm, I'm not trying to take him apart. I mean, I think what he did with his with his capitalization on female sexuality is absolutely unforgivable. But, well, I, that's enough of that. I mean, th that, was, that was beyond the pale in my estimation. There was no, there's no excuse for that whatsoever. Now, you know, if you're a basement dwelling incel, the mere fact that you could imagine ever doing that, sort of like you imagining yourself, you know, in a loincloth covered with blood, the mere idea that a man, which is what you are, could even imagine, manage doing that, having a harem, you know, of women, who are offering sexual favors at, at your beck and call. Well, that's a much higher calling than castrated, over obese, resentful loser who can't leave the basement, right? Because that's an even low... I suppose, you know, when you're in the lowest rung of hell, the rung right above looks like heaven. And, and it, it's up. It's up. That aggression, that aggression is very, very necessary. You know, it's it's very necessary. And sports are a great way of of, of putting that in its proper place, especially team sports. Because mm. you, you can take that competitive instinct and that instinct to win, that instinct to be competent more deeply, and you can you can put it in its proper place. And it is an immense source of implacability. Immense. Now, in a you know, social certainly something I draw on when I lecture, for example. Like, it's a source of energy. It's just sitting right there. Interesting. Why is that so effective? Ag anger, ang aggression is a, a very primordial instinct. Very. Yeah. And, and it, it activates both the positive emotion systems, which are forward moving, and the negative emotion systems that awaken you. It's high stress. Like, there's nothing more stressful than being angry. It's very psychophysiologically mm -hmm. demanding. It's very psychophysiologically stressful. But it's also as a as an as a alerting as a form of alerting arousal, in some ways, it's unparalleled. Mm -hmm. And and it's great to have it at hand. You you don't want to rep see the Freudian model with regard to aggression was repression. Like we have this terrible id that's trying to make itself clamber upward. You know, all red and tooth and claw. There's some truth in that, but his model of how that was regulated by socialization, it was insufficient. It's not repression. It's not inhibition. Now, he kind of knew that because he talked about sublimation. Piaget, Jean Piaget, had a much better model, much more, much wiser. And Piaget observed actual children. A competitive child who socialized integrates the capacity for aggression into the game. And then he becomes the player every kid wants on his team because he still wants to win. So he's, he's got that forward driving intensity and skill, but, but he does that in a manner that brings everyone along with them, mm. right? And so then it's not, aggression isn't inhibited, it's integrated. And, and the more aggression you can integrate, well, the more compelling you are, 100%. Like that's, that's the, 
that's what that's what women are after. That's because the fundamental, I think the fundamental female hero story is essentially Beauty and the Beast. And a woman is after a, a civilized beast. Like literally, that's that all female pornography has that structure. Civilized beast. You know, and it can tilt a little hard in the beast direction when it gets a little masochistic and it, you know, can turn a little hard in the, in the civilized direction when it's kind of a, like, when it's a romance that tilts more in the direction of friendship. Woody Allen would probably be a good example of that as a character in his own movies. Mm. But, you know, there's a, you can imagine that there's a range in there where the solution can be offered in a variety of different forms. Yeah, I think you were the one that pointed me to a book that was utterly transformational, A Billion Wicked Thoughts. Yeah, yeah, right. What I find great, really book. interesting is it isn't just a civilized beast, it is a beast I civilize with my magic hoo-ha, which is what they say in the book. Right. But right, right. that that I find very interesting and has somehow become Well, women probably did the same thing to men that humans did to wolves. That's fucking mm. interesting, man. Uh, tell me more about that. That is really interesting. Well, you know, you want a wolf like that's trying to eat you or do you want a wolf on your side? Well, that's the situation women are in. I mean, you've seen the cartoon representations, do you, Tex Avery's cartoons from mm -hmm. the 1940s. I think they were the 40s with the wolf who's like completely sexually, what, obsessed with Tex Avery. Hearts Avery's flying out of his eyes oh, and yes, stuff. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and he's always after the singer who sings old wolfy. You know, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, women definitely tame men, obviously. Yes, clearly. They probably tamed them by offering them sex and fruit. You know, so... Because they want to gatherers. It, Women are gatherers. They're not hunters. Really makes me sad that we can't, that the uh, public discussion around this, people get so weird about so fast. You actually did a really amazing interview. I think her name was Dr. Sarah Hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Sarah that, was good. I found that utterly fascinating, mm. talking about just what men do to get women's attention, the demands Everything. that women make it. Yeah, <laughs> literally. That all Everything the things- Everything and anything is the answer to that. 100%. My yeah. success is literally tied to my desire to impress my now wife, then mm. uh, fiance, when I really turned it on, I was like, well, I've got well, to become- Well, the correlation something. between- male trappings of socioeconomic success and male reproductive success is like, it's like 0. 0.7. For women, it's negative, it's zero, it's lower than zero. Like women, men don't care at all about the, when men aren't looking for, in women, for what women look for in men. Correct. So, and not a bit even, not no. a bit even. And, and that plays out also in the structure of female motivation. You know, men are very competitive. They'll, and, and in, in unidimensional in some ways, one-eyed, you might say, right? And there's an immense symbolic level, uh, web of associations around that idea, the one-eyed giant. Well, the penis is a one-eyed giant, like obviously, right? And it's, it's a seeking, it's, a, it's, it's part of a seeking system, seeking women, and it'll do that unidimensionally. Right, and so, and men are like that. Freud knew this, that men are like this from the cellular level up. And so they'll specialize, they'll hyper-specialize obsessively in a manner women are just not interested in. They can, but they're not interested in it. And partly they're not interested in it because that isn't what, it doesn't attract men, that, that capability. Mm. You know, the, the men really I work with in big law firms, for example, hyper-competitive men. You know, and they were, they're very concerned about their bonus, but not because they needed the money. He said, well, the money's just a way of keeping score. And they all said that. They all knew that. They laughed about it. It's like they, they wanted a bigger bonus than the next guy. The amount didn't matter. The comparative amount mattered a lot. And it was right. it's part of a status ranking, you know, and, and that's everything for young men. Status ranking. God, yes. I mean, they'll, they'll die for that. They'll kill for that. Like, it's not like we don't know this. It's in the criminology literature. This is crystal clear. You know, the gang, a tremendous amount of gang violence is, is status competition. But even more than the, even the economic element of that is subordinate to the status competition. Mm. So, yeah, that's, that's crystal clear, crystal clear. So, all right, there's another idea that I need to put this post in or counter enlightenment idea up against. Uh, 
what's going on in Hamas, Israel, that conflict. You've got two religions, supposedly both packaging up a ton of wisdom, but mm -hmm. when they collide, it's ugly and it mm -hmm. won't go away. Is there a danger in trying to communicate wisdom in a religious package? Of course, there's danger in every, in everything, in every endeavor. Um, the danger is the confusion of the religious enterprise with dogmatic certainty, fundamentally. I mean, the, there's no reason to assume at all that the religious enterprise can't degenerate into totalitarian psychopathy, for that matter, it does all the time. Not least because it's in the interest of the totalitarian psychopaths to hijack the religious enterprise. Now, they do that all the time. That's their modus operandi. Again, that's the same people that Christ is contending with constantly in the Gospels. I mean, at multiple levels, he contends with the tyrants themselves from Rome, but it's not like there's no tyrants in the Jewish community, and all of those tyrants use religion to be tyrannical with. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's the most egregious sin, or one of the most egregious sins. So the third commandment, it depends on how you count them, but the third commandment is generally held to indicate something like, do not use God's name in vain. And people think that means don't swear, and it kind of means that in some trivial way. But mostly what it means is, do not claim divine motivation for self-serving behavior. And that's what all the protesters are doing. We're so compassionate in public. It's like, no, I don't think so. I think you're narcissistic psychopaths, fundamentally. And if you're not, well, at that moment, you're certainly possessed by that spirit. Look at how good we are. That's why Christ says in the Gospels not to let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. If you're going to be good, do it in secret. Why? So you don't, so you don't fall prey to the temptation to make your good subordinate to your pride. Right? That's what the bloody Oedipal mothers do all the time. Mm -hmm. Look how much I love my son. Yeah. He doesn't even have a penis anymore. We He's solved that problem for him. Wow. Yeah, wow. It's so bloody. It's so brutal. It's so dark. It's it's virtually unimaginable. It's such a pit. It's so awful. And then the mother can parade around with what what has she got? Her son's genitals on a stick. <laughs> so she can parade down the street. Oh, absolutely. And show her neighbors. Look how compassionate I am. No matter what he turns into, I still love him. Brutal. Would you Brutal. say that, or would it be something more along the lines of, he n is so loving and so compassionate for having been at my breast that he has essentially voluntarily discarded oh, these that'd toxic. That'd be your name. That'd be your cover story. <laughs> and you know, the other part of that secret desire is well, immense hatred for men. Immense, immense hatred for men. For for or for what? that particular breed of woman thinks men stand for and are so you know where where does that come from if for oh it comes from all sorts of places lots of those lots of women like that were terribly damaged by men by power mad men you know who hurt them in all sorts of terrible ways they lots of these people you know you hear their story and you think well it's no wonder you think that way but that's that's no, that's no excuse because many people who are terribly abused don't grow up to be abusers mm -hmm. They decide that they're going to take the opposite route, you know. You can learn a lot from being abused, and one of the things you can learn is not to do it. So Lots what idea learn, has uh, possessed them <clears throat> that makes them break bad when that horrific thing happens to them? I think you have to read my new book. I can't, I can't, I can't simp it's too complicated to simplify. Let's see if I can come up with some reasonable I'm virtuous because I was hurt that'd be that's part of it for sure mm. yeah and that's part of the if you're a victim you're an infant and if you're a infant victim then you're moral and to be protected at all cost and anything that threatens you is a predator and there's nothing too terrible for a predator, right? To meet out to a predator, which is another part of the underground attraction for that, because this is the horror show of the oppressor oppressed narrative. Once you identify the oppressed and you identify them with innocence, you identify the oppressor with predation.
or even worse, parasitical predation. It's exactly what Hitler did to the Jews. 100% predatory parasite. What do you do with predatory parasites? You burn them to the ground. No holds barred. No, no punishment is too extreme. And then, well, then you get Auschwitz. So brutal. And then you get to have all the delights of being the Auschwitz guard. Auschwitz guard. And then the darkest part of your soul has the chance to come out and play. Is that what you think is going on right now? I was, I was taken aback. I did not see it coming that uh, there were pro-Palestine marches on October 8th. So oh, pre-Israel's no, response. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely what's happening. I mean, it's very straightforward. It's algorithmic. Oppressor, oppressed. Well, how do you know the oppressors? They're statistically overrepresented in positions of authority. And obviously, by definition, then they're oppressors. Well, who's most statistically overrepresented in positions of authority? Jews. <laughs> That's like the door's open, man. So why are they the canary in the coal mine? Why, in a way that is so bizarre throughout well, history? Part of the reason it's part of it is the reason I just said. So then you might say, well, why are they? more likely to be successful. Well, they're smarter, that's part of it, by a lot. You mean at a truly- Biological um, level. That they just, as, as a group, they have a higher IQ. Yeah, and they have neurological problems that go along with that, like- Is that controversial or are of people- Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> do, but do people debate the yes. fact? <laughs> Stupid people debate it. Well, I'm serious. Like the 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 intel the IQ literature has something in it to appall everyone mm. deeply. I, I mastered that literature in like 1993, four, with a student of mine who I still work with, brilliant student. He got bounced right out of the whole academic world because of the response to his work, partly on IQ. Well, we were, were looking at neuropsychological functions associated with the prefrontal cortex specifically, but it devolved into IQ because everything to do with abstraction devolves into IQ. Hmm. I, IQ is a brutal literature. And so, and Jews, you know, what Ashkenazi Jews specifically, they have IQs that are probably 15 points higher than the typical, than the typical 15 points. Yeah. So they're Whoa. radically over, overrepresented. So you know, at the middle, that doesn't make that much difference, although it makes some, they're very likely to be at the top of their class. But if you go out to like IQ 145, mm -hmm. where the serious action starts, Jews are way overrepresented. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like that theory, well, how about they have a giant conspiracy to take over the world as a substitute theory? So I don't care which of those theories you like. It's like, you're gonna, both of them are like fire. Both of those theories are fire. Mm -hmm. And so, but you're stuck with one or the other. So that's life, that's life, you know? Ooh. And so what, what should happen is that people should be bloody happy that there's smart Jews around and the Jews should be very careful not to take their intellectual superiority as a marker of, what would you say, excess intrinsic worth. No, I'm not saying that they are more prone to that than anyone else, by the way, but it is a, it is a temptation for intelligent mm. people to identify with their intelligence and to become prideful. Right. That's actually how, in some ways, how God keeps the eternal scales of cosmic justice balanced. So imagine you're born with an IQ of 145. Well, then you might think, well, that's not very fair because what about the poor guy who's born with an IQ of 85? And those mm -hmm. are very different. They're very, 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 very different. And, and you say, well, that's completely unfair. It's like, fair enough. But the guy with the IQ of 145 is, is, prone to the temptations of the pride of the intellect. And that is Lucifer, right? Like that's the worst temptation. And so Lucifer is the spirit of intellect gone most dreadfully wrong. And so sure, you can have an IQ of 145, but man, you better, uh, you better be on your knees in gratitude that that gift was given to you and you better not misuse it because if that thing takes the upper hand, you are in the hands of the worst possible agent of destruction. Mm. And of course, like, well, no, it's the intellect that goes most dreadfully wrong, that's not the worst possible threat. So obviously that's the worst possible threat. And so, you know, it says in the gospels that if you've been given a lot, you'll, there'll be a lot demanded of you. And that goes for intelligent people. They better develop some humility. Uh, 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 a virtue that's sadly lacking at the moment with our worship of pride, let's say. Mm. Pride and hedonism, Jesus.
brutal. Those two ideas in particular, you think grip people today? Power, pride, and hedonism. Yeah, that's a, that's a, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, if you make your sexual identity paramount, it's like, <laughs> you've identified the I with, with the impulse, essentially, with the whim, right? Because sex is a whim, like obviously. Now, does it rule? Well, what what is it that you are if sex rules? You're the wolf, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. And a wolf to yourself too. So, you know, when you see this ambivalence on the left, because on the one hand, anything goes and all forms of sexuality are to be like celebrated, mm -hmm. worshiped, essentially, because celebration and worship are the same thing. Yet sex is so dangerous, especially between like members of a young heterosexual pair, that absolutely every single bit of it has to be regulated right to the last word. It's like, well, you, licentiousness breeds tyranny. That's why the whore of Babylon is on the great scarlet beast of the state at the end of time. Tell me exactly what that means when you break it down. Well, imagine that when masculinity degenerates, the state pathologizes, the patriarchy mm -hmm. pathologizes. Well, what happens to females? They pathologize too. Well, where do, how do they pathologize? In the direction of disinhibited sexuality. So, 35% of internet traffic is pornographic. Yeah, but that's not driven by women, that's driven by men. It's driven by bloody women, too. Whoa. Parading themselves. Absolutely. Interesting. It might be, like, there's no shortage of electronic pimps and desperate engineers, let's <laughs> say, but that doesn't mean the women who engage in that are innocent by any stretch of the imagination. They're, they're, uh, they're doing the same thing with their sexuality that, the, that, the, that people granted the talent of intelligence do with their, with their with their gift. Look at me. It's like, no, no, wrong, wrong. Those women online displaying themselves, they're succubi. They're not human. You're a fool if you think that's human. You're a fool. At minimum, it's a machine-human hybrid. A woman doesn't appear in a million places at the same time. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, that's not a woman. Yeah, what do you make of the OnlyFans Ooh. dynamic between men and women? Uh, the more I look at this, the more I'm getting freaked out. There was a, a woman named... Well, you have to stop looking then. Yeah, Isn't that well, <laughs> looking at it truly through a research lens, but yeah. uh, Belle Delphine, I believe is her name. Uh, back in 2020, she sold 10 million pounds worth of her bath water. <laughs> oh, that's and, perfect. Yeah. The Whore of Babylon has a cup full of liquid, by the way, in gold, a gold cup full of liquid that she offers the world. Really? Absolutely. 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 Look at how wonderful this is. It's actually, what does it say in the book of Revelations? It's filled with the filth of her abominations. God, perfect. So, so what is that? It's people wanting to consume that thing they can't have, that they have Definitely. idolized? Of course. Of course. It's it, It's... It's people wanting to consume the thing that is denied to them because they hid their light under a bushel. Because they hid, uh, they hid who they could become yes. from themselves and never pursued it. Sure, and so they're not attractive to themselves or anyone else. Absolutely. Holy shit! Okay, oh, so yes, hold on. that's for sure. Oh yes, brutal. Brutal, brutal. So you've got brutal. women uh, ascending to a position of power. With that weird dynamic of postmodernism, uh, they've been given a gift of being able to be, be persuade men through their mm -hmm. beauty to yeah. do what they will, to get the attention that they want. Mm -hmm. Now, as a mechanical hybrid, they're able to appear in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions sit of on, places. Sit on the chests of men and take their essence from them. <laughs> And then men are hiding their potential away from themselves, Partly which also... because they're punished for... Yeah, I was going to say. But, but that, then that gives them an excuse for not doing it. Because mm. they think, well, I'm going to... The young guys, let's say, who decide to be useless, you know, some of it's genuine response to not being encouraged and to being punished. Some of it is, but some of it, it's pretty convenient. It's like, you don't have to put your cross on your shoulder. Mm. It's like, 
no one wants me to do that anyways. It's like, well, yeah, that, that's always been the case. And I mean, in some ways, you know, there's, there's new impediments to striding forward confidently, but there's always been impediments. You know, it's so interesting. So I, uh, I train anybody that will listen, uh, that you need to have beliefs in your life. And since facts are overwhelming, it's not about recognizing what's true. It's about recognizing what's useful is how I think of it. Uh, so you have a set of beliefs, you have a set of values. So you have hierarchy, what useful matters to me. Useful in relationship to the right end. That's correct. The, that's a thousand right. percent, which is why yeah. I always lead with, you have to have a goal and that goal needs to be honorable. Yeah. So you've got well, beliefs. Well, you see, so the thing is, that's where your God lies. The, your this, God this lies in I'm the going. end. Well, your God lies in the ineffable of in the ineffable extent of what you regard as useful. Yes. So imagine that useful tilts in a in a direction. The sum total of all that would of all that would be most properly useful. Mm. The essence of that, that's the God. That's the implicit God. Yeah, I'm realizing I have built from the ground up a system that is designed to do all the things that religion does. It's really interesting. This to me is it's fascinating because whenever you discover the same thing from multiple different mm. disciplines, you can be pretty sure you're converging mm. on the truth because everybody's just going, what actually works? Uh, but the last thing, the last part of my cocktail is rules. So you need rules in your life. Basically, there need to be things that you don't do. Um, <clears throat> I'm no, that's, that's good. That's good. That's exactly right. That's, mm. that's where conscious. So you can imagine the spirit of God in the Old Testament makes himself manifest in two forms. Calling. And conscience, and conscience is that, what mm -hmm. you just described. It's like the guardrails. It's like you're going off the path, you know? So there's fences and warnings on the conscience side. But it's the same thing, and it's the dynamic between, so this is what happens in the movie Pinocchio. So Pinocchio is called out into the world. His father is benevolent, a benevolent creator, that's mm -hmm. Geppetto. He's called out into the world to make himself manifest, to realize himself, to become real. And there's two things that attract him. He wants to go out and learn and have his adventure. That's the calling. And, but it, that has to be allied with the conscience. And the reason for that is the calling alone gets him in trouble. Like, first of all, it, it entices him to becoming a narcissistic, psychopathic, manipulative actor. That's when he's on stage, right? Then it entices him into lying to get away with things and to get what he wants. So that's another extension of that manipulation. Then it entices him to become neurotic enough so that he can take a permanent holiday. Then he goes to Pleasure Island where he can engage in hedonism. That's where the slavers are. Right. And so he needs, that's what, that's what just the calling alone, you know, will take him places that are attractive, but not appropriate. You need a conscience along for the ride. And that's Jiminy Cricket, mm. right? And Jiminy Cricket is what bugs you. Exactly. Yes. And so that's one of the places you can find your destiny is in what bothers you. There's going to be an array of things that make themselves manifest to you as callings of your conscience. Those are problems. Those are your problems. Why is that your problem? It's like, well, can you stop thinking about it? Does it bug you all the time? Well, hey, there you go. That's your destiny. Mm. Right. Where does this all go? You've got Canada has declined economically. You guys are now making 60% of what Americans are making. China yeah, is... Yeah, we can do worse than that. With oh, Jesus, let's hope not. Uh, China is watching everything everybody does. They're way beyond 1984. Mm -hmm. 2024 in the US is... Uh, it's terrifying. The election, does it actually build up the eh? civil war? I don't know. Yep, UK. Yeah. You've got conflict, Russia, Ukraine. You've got conflict, Israel... You got the farmers uh, Gaza. revolt in Europe. Yeah. Like, mm. where does this go? Uh, it depends on how many of us shoulder our crosses and walk uphill. I I really mean that. Like, we're at that point. Wake up. Figure out which side you're on. If you were a betting man, hmm? what odds do you give um, U.S. Civil War? What odds do you give World War Three? Well, we, huh. we're already in World War III, so I'd give that 100%. How far will it go? Depends on how stiff-necked we are, mm. right? So the Egyptian tyrant is visited by, is it 10 plagues? The last plague is the destruction of the future itself. That's the death of the firstborn. So, you know, it depends on how 
hard we have to be hit before we wake up. And there's no end to that. You know, I mean, God destroys the whole world in a flood. You know, that never happened. It's like, how about it's happening all the time? How about it's happened forever? It's happening now. It will happen forever. How high does the water have to rise? Till people learn. And what does it mean to learn? Well, this is why I'm a psychologist, not a politician. Or a theologian, to whatever degree I lay pretensions to that. Someone concerned with spiritual matters, let's say. Psychological matters. Redemption is a matter of individual determination. So that's why I operate at the big level of the individual. How far will we have to go? Depends on how many sins you decide to continue harboring. How are you connected? How is that decision connected to the destiny of the world? We all bear the world on our shoulders. How, how can that be true? Here's one way of thinking about it. How much better would the people around you be if you were better? Some, obviously. What's the ultimate extent of that? What if you were everything you could be? That's what you're called upon to be. You're called upon to be everything you can be. Why? Not least because the <laughs> try getting through the world without doing it. Then you'll end up in the position of Cain. You didn't offer your best. You'll be rejected by man, woman, and God, and yourself. And then what? Then you're bitter. Then you're fratricidal. Then you're murderous. Then you're genocidal. Then the flood comes. Or you erect the Tower of Babel. It's always the same. And now you can see it. Like, it's just right there. Why? Because it's fa happening so fast. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing, Jordan. Where can people follow you? Where can they get your book? Well, I just, my book has just been announced. It won't be available until November, but you can pre-order it. And so any standard book selling site has it available as of two days ago. Um, people can come on and hear me talk about the things we talked about today on my tour. I've got 48 cities left. I'm going to tour with my wife who speaks as well and is getting very good at it. I'm going to tour with Jonathan Paggio for some of it and with Constantine Kissin. Ah. So that'll be very interesting. And, um, uh, then we're also launching Peterson Academy in very short order, and that's our attempt to provide people with the highest quality possible education, genuine education in the general arts and sciences domain at approximately the undergraduate level to as many people as we can possibly manage at the, in the most accessible possible way. That'll be launching very soon. Um, I've been working on an app with my son called Essay that teaches people how to think and write. And you need to know that because you need to master the verbal domain so that you're articulate and competent. And young men are never told this. There's, why do you like rap musicians? Because they're articulate. It's attractive. There's nothing more attractive than being articulate. So get your words in order there, guys. And this Essay app helps teaches you how to, to, to ask the right questions, to search for the answers in the appropriate place, to e examine the revelations that you're granted, to sort them out and to put yourself together. And so we organize ourselves at the highest level with words. So words matter. Every single word matters. Every single word. Those are the fruits of the tree that, those are the fruits that, the tree that you most truly are has to offer. That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. So. I love that's it. the situation. There it is. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. Check out my intense conversation with Patrick Bet David about masculinity. 
Are men today weak? And if so, what can we do about it? If you look at data, yes. From 1960 till today, our population has increased around 90%. But in